So this morning, my sermon is broken into two parts, and there will be an intermission in the middle. Um, and there, the two parts that they're broken into, the first part is kind of, uh, I call it the, the teaching. It's, it's kind of didactic and intellectual. And then uh, in the second part, we're going to be, it'll be kind of applied to us. Um, so part one, I once took a course on Judaism taught by a brilliant professor named Steve Wasserstrom, and the class was organized around a central question, the question of who is Jewish? Um, or another way to ask that question, what is it that confers Jewish identity? I remember as a student thinking, well, that's an easy question. How hard could it be to distinguish who is Jewish from, from who isn't? But the learning experience of that class challenged that certainty and problematized the question. Identity, it turns out, is complex, and religious identity is especially complex. So what I want to do is rapidly kind of recreate some of the questions from that class, adding some of my own. Uh, in your order of service, I had Muncie replicate a list of categories that may or may not confer religious identity so that you can play along in the pews. And we're going to move fast, so hold on tight. When it comes to religious identity, we often think that belief, what it is that we believe, is what confers identity. However, in some religious traditions, including possibly Judaism, it may not be that simple. There are many Jews, for instance, who insist that they are atheists or doubt some of the miracle stories in the Bible, but claim that this doubt or even this atheism makes them no less Jewish. So maybe it's not belief. Perhaps then Jewish identity is conferred by practice and observance. Do you celebrate Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Passover? Do you light candles and say the blessings and prayers on Shabbos? But if Judaism is a matter of observance, is there a minimum level of observance that's necessary in order to claim that identity? Must you also observe Shavuot, Sukkot, and Purim? Do you stop being Jewish if you stop observing Shabbos on Friday evenings? And what are we to do with Messianic Christian groups that celebrate the Jewish holidays? Are they authentically Jewish too? Someone might have a problem with that. And what about those celebrities who get interested in Kabbalah and wear the red string bracelets? Is Madonna Jewish? Or is Jewish identity conferred by cultural practices? Is it a matter of knowing Hebrew or Yiddish, listening to klezmer music, enjoying latkes and matzo ball soup? If you don't like matzo ball soup, is your identity in question? <laughs> or perhaps religious identity is a matter of adhering to a set of commandments or a set of rules. But to single out one particular area of Jewish law, we know not every Jew keeps kosher. And not every person who keeps kosher is Jewish. I think of the book, The Year of Living Biblically, by the author A.J. Jacobs, in which the author attempts to spend a year following all of the halakhic commandments from the Hebrew Bible. But if I were to create that experiment, would that make me Jewish at the end of the year or not? So maybe religious identity is tied to belonging, to participation in religious community. Maybe to be Jewish requires that you belong to a synagogue. But this is problematic as well. If you resign your membership at a synagogue, are you also resigning Judaism or not? Well, maybe it's not about believing, observing, practicing, or belonging. Maybe it has to do with a particular kind of worldview shaped by story and history. If you identify yourself with the stories of Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, Abraham and Isaac, Moses and Miriam, Jonah and Job, as well as the other narratives from the Jewish tradition, maybe identification with those stories is enough to determine identity. Or maybe not. In the case of Judaism, there are those who've insisted that Jewishness is a racial or ethnic identity. 
Remember from this fall, the amazing play that was put on here, The Diary of Anne Frank. In the play, there is the character, Mr. Dussel, who goes into hiding with the Frank family. There's this scene when they're celebrating Hanukkah, and Mr. Dussel has no idea what the holiday is about. Is he Jewish or not? How does family heritage factor into identity? Are you automatically Jewish if your parents are Jewish? But then try to solve this riddle. Two babies are born at a hospital, one to Jewish parents and the other to Christian parents. The hospital makes a blunder, and the two babies are switched at birth. The Jewish parents raise the child they take home as a Jew. The Christians raise the child they take home as a Christian. So which child is Jewish, then? Are they both? Are they neither? What is it that confers identity? Wouldn't it be easier to make religious identity a matter of self-identification? You're Jewish or any other religion if you say you are a member of that religion. But isn't this problematic as well? If I were to announce that I've decided that I'm Jewish or Muslim or Wiccan, would it be fair for one of you to raise your hand and say, no, actually, I don't think you are? <laughs> Belief, practice, culture, community, rule-keeping, ethnicity, family heritage, self-identification. Maybe religious identity isn't entirely one thing. Maybe it's some combination. But now we find ourselves in even deeper trouble. Who's to say which qualities are more essential than others for a person to have? How do we weigh and rank all these different determinants? Do you have to have one from column A and two from column B? Well, who's creating which column goes which? And so what I've hoped to do in this teaching about religious identity is to muddy things up a little bit and introduce the idea that identities are complex and multifaceted. We'll apply some of these questions and considerations to our understanding of Unitarian Universalist identity in just a few moments. But first, we'll pause for a moment of reflection. In the 1500s, while Europe was being torn apart by conflicts between different religions, um, the Catholics and then two strains of Protestantism, Lutherans and Calvinists, a little baby prince was born um, in Transylvania, and his mother very wisely said when, when asked how she was going to raise her son and what faith, she said, faith is a gift of God and no one. Imagine that. Imagine waiting for news of what will be the religion of the land to determine whether your beliefs and practices will be accepted or whether you'll have to change. So if it became illegal to be a Unitarian Universalist, would there be enough evidence to convict you? I believe the, this type of question was, was first asked in a more evangelical Christian context. If it became illegal to be Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? It was asked as a kind of, of in-your-face admonishment to practice your faith publicly and visibly. Don't keep it a secret. Don't hide your light under a bushel basket. When this question gets translated into a Unitarian Universalist context, it becomes more a question about self-understanding. What is it that shapes our UU identity? What exactly is it that confers UU identity onto us? Rest assured, it's not illegal to be a Unitarian Universalist now, and, and I don't think anybody's proposing it, although we might look back to the example of Transylvania, which we've heard uh, sung about this morning, to see what such a situation was like. But imagine for a moment that you're a prosecutor trying to make the case that someone is a Unitarian Universalist. 
what evidence would you produce? How would you go about making the case? This morning we're talking about UU identity, and I think it's important to do so for a couple of reasons. For one thing, it's worthwhile from time to time to consider our own identity as Unitarian Universalists and what it means to be a part of this chosen faith. For another thing, among the goals that we've agreed on for ourselves as a church, one of those goals is helping our children and youth to develop a stronger UU identity. And so we might ask about what that looks like and how we would go about helping them to have a stronger identity. And since children and youth look to us to model the values and virtues and identities we hold, we should probably have some sense of what a UU identity looks like for ourselves. But I also think it's worth asking about what makes for a UU identity because it's a question that, when posed a certain way, can evoke a lot of anxiety. <clears throat> Let's face it, we are not a big religion, number-wise. In fact, if you added up the membership of every UU church in the United States, there would only be about 150,000 total UUs. However, and this is interesting, when you do demographic studies and ask people and the population at large what religion they are, it turns out, if you look at census figures and other studies, it turns out that there are about 600,000 Americans who claim to be Unitarian Universalists. That means that for every single Unitarian Universalist who is a member of a congregation like this one, there are an additional three who claim to be UUs but are not on the membership rolls of any of our churches. I find this fascinating. Who are these people and what is the basis for claiming that identity? Were they ever members? Did they just read Ralph Waldo Emerson and discover a philosophical kinship? But others find this anxiety producing and worry about this. That's a lot of people self-identifying as UU who probably don't have any substantial connection with UU communities. Someone I know and love puts it this way saying the ones who participate in communities, those are the real UUs. The ones who don't think they are, but they're not. <laughs> hmm, how would we feel about that? In the 1980s, the Unitarian Universal Association launched a marketing campaign with print advertisements that showed a picture of individuals and couples and families and the question, are you a Unitarian Universalist without knowing it? <laughs> And I'm probably reading this question too literally, but is it actually possible to be you, you without knowing it? Hmm. What does it mean, then, to have a you, you identity? In the West, we tend to equate religious identity with systems of belief. For many, the test of Christian identity is belief in a set of theological statements about Jesus and the Trinity. Christians believe this, and those who do not believe this are not Christian. Christianity is equated with belief to such an extent that if someone were to say, I think of myself as a Christian, but I don't believe in God, that person would likely be met by other people saying, well, then you're not really Christian. In the world in which we live, belief is privileged as necessary for identity. But belief, we've learned, is just one facet of identity. In our contemporary manifestation, shared belief is not what shapes our sense of common UU identity. We proudly say that we are non-creedal. We reject the idea that we're bound together by a shared statement of faith. Instead, we say that we are a covenantal religious tradition, that what we share is an agreement of how we will strive to be together. So if we're not held together by belief, what shapes our identity? On the list of things that might shape one person's religious identity, there are several other categories besides belief that we can dismiss as not applying to us. Our religious identity is not grounded in ethnicity or race, and our religious identity is not automatically passed along from generation to generation. For most of us here, our parents were not UU, and we would never say to somebody, you're not a real you-you because your parents weren't. 
That would sound weird here. Likewise, our identity is not shaped by adherence to a set of prescribed rules, laws, and commandments. I could give you a list of rules, laws, and commandments to follow, and many of you would break them. We tend to think of ourselves as rule breakers, not rule followers. <laughs> so this list, this list of what might confer religious identity is quickly getting pared down. And so I ask you, apart from apart from the mandatory chalice tattoo and <laughs> you didn't know about that, did you? <laughs> and the set of secret handshakes. What are the main markers of a UU identity? And I would say that there are two, that the two main markers of UU identity are first and foremost participation in community with other UUs, and second, a shared narrative, shared story of history. For us, I think participation in community is one of the main things that confers a UU identity, and I question, I question whether it's possible to be a UU alone. The seven principles that we share are not intellectual propositions to be affirmed, but relational realities to work towards within our communities. Justice, equity, compassion, acceptance, encouragement to spiritual growth, democratic process, interdependence, these are relational principles to be lived into. We make them manifest in our community. That's how we practice our faith. I think the most important aspect of UU identity is participation in religious community. That's what being a covenantal faith is all about. We're a, a promise-making people. And so the question is, what kind of community will we create? I'll tell you that one of our lesser sins is the sin of celebrity worship, which is to say if there is a rumor that some celebrity is a Unitarian Universalist, no matter how scant the evidence, <laughs> no matter how, you know, no matter how incredible the rumor, we will automatically adopt that person. And so it is that we have adopted many great thinkers and leaders into the identity of Unitarian Universalism, even if there's scant evidence they had any real participation in community. Um, but one of the people that we have, we have welcomed in with open arms is um, the great science fiction author, Kurt Vonnegut. I'm a, I'm a big, anybody, any Vonnegut fans out there, I'm a big Vonnegut fan. And Vonnegut has this really interesting um, remark about community in one of his novels, and I think that it hints at what it means to have a deep UU identity in community. Um, Vonnegut coins two, two phrases. The first one is the, the phrase, a grand falloon. Does anyone, anyone know what a grand falloon is? A couple nods. A grand falloon is, in, in Vonnegut's novel, Cat's Cradle, it is a superficial connection between people who really don't have that much in common. It, it, uh, the word comes about in this way that, that they're on a plane flight uh, to the Caribbean and um, the protagonist is wearing an Iowa sweatshirt and somebody, and this was back in the day when I guess people walked around on the plane, somebody stand up and walk down the aisle and goes, you're a Hoosier too, I'm a Hoosier, best buddies. And then uh, a woman in the back of the plane yells, I'm a Hoosier too. That is, in Vonnegut's term, a grand, a grand falloon, that it is a, a relational connection that, that's lacking in, in depth. Um, and, and Vonnegut contrasts this with an idea of a grouping that he calls a caress. And what a caress is, is it is a, a group of people who share an intimate bond, an intimate bond around a common mission of trying to move the world in a direction that fulfills the desire of God. And what, and what people are longing for is to find their caress, their deep community. And I think that at its deepest level, sort of that deepest sense of UU identity is found when people are able to look at each other in a, in a small group or a congregation or a class or a camp 
or a youth group meeting or a worship service and to say to each other, These, this, is my, this is my caress. So community is one marker of UU identity. And the other one is a story. Um, we have a rich story and whether we're telling the story of Arius or Michael Servetus, whether we're telling the story of the Transylvanians or the Transcendentalists, whether we're telling the story of Susan B. Anthony or James Reeb, the shared story that we tell is that of a world moving in the direction of greater inclusion and greater freedom, a breaking down of the barriers of separation and a moving in the direction of a more beloved world. We have an affinity for that story, such an affinity that whether the actors in that story are Unitarian Universalist or not, it does not matter to us. We are tellers of a story, of a world moving in the direction of greater inclusion, greater love, and greater justice in both a human sense and in a cosmic sense. If it became illegal to be a Unitarian Universalist, would there be enough evidence to convict you? My challenge to you in this new year, my challenge to you in this new year is to do one or two or three or 12 more things that would add to that evidence that might be used against you. Amen.